This little steam engine is probably why your photos aren't turning out the way you want. Let me explain. Okay, so maybe you just got your first camera, dusting off the old hobby, or are looking to up your game as a photographer. Maybe you've checked out some online forums and heard that you're not a real photographer until you learn how to shoot in manual. It's not true. Or you feel like you're just pointing and clicking and not getting the results you want. Maybe you feel like you're missing moments or photos are constantly coming out blurry because you don't know where your settings should be for specific situations. Well, my goal for you by the end of this video is to be able to look at a scene, look at a photo, and instantly know how to fix it to get it looking the way that you want. Be able to say, ah, my shutter speed was too low or my aperture was too high. I could probably bump my ISO a bit more. Let's take control away from the camera and give it to you. So for the next 10 minutes, I want you to take any fear or preconceived ideas of how complex or complicated shooting in manual can be and set them aside. I am going to break it down and show you just how simple of a process it really is so you can get to creating the type of images you've always dreamed of. In basic photography, our goal for every photo is four things. It's exposed correctly, our subject or subjects are in focus, it's sharp, which is different than being in focus, but we'll dive into that in a sec. And it has as little noise as possible. The way we achieve these goals is by a combination of three different settings, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. These three settings are the building blocks of every image you will take. And understanding these, how they work, and how they affect your final image will unlock the door of understanding and take your photography to the next level. Photography in its most basic form is just capturing light. So let's walk through how light enters and is captured by your camera and how we can use that light to get the exact images we want. Let's start with aperture. Aperture is actually controlled by the lens and relates to the amount of light being let through your lens. Your lens has blades inside that open and close to let in more or less light. The size of the hole that those blades produce is your aperture. When your aperture is wide open, it lets in more light to your camera, making your images brighter. And when it's closed down, it lets in less light, making your images darker. The amount of light being let through is measured in what are called f-stops. And one thing you have to remember is that the larger the aperture, or the hole in your lens, the smaller the f-stop number. So it's basically backwards of what you would think. An f1.8 lets in more light and is a larger aperture than f22. So just remember, bigger aperture, smaller f-stop number equals more light. Smaller aperture, larger f-stop number equals less light. Different lenses have different apertures and it's one of the main reasons one lens will cost more than another. Next, let's talk about shutter speed. Okay, like we just said, aperture is the amount of light coming into your camera through the lens. Shutter speed is the amount of time you allow that light to hit the sensor of your camera. When you press the shutter button to capture a photo, the shutter opens for a specified amount of time and then closes. The amount of time that your shutter is open and your camera's sensor is exposed to the light coming through your lens is called the shutter speed. The slower the shutter speed, the longer amount of time that your sensor is exposed to light, meaning the brighter the photo will be. The faster your shutter speed, the shorter amount of time that your sensor is exposed to light, meaning the darker your photo will be. Great, now let's talk about ISO. Once the light comes through your lens and through your open shutter, it hits your camera sensor. As we said, your ISO is how sensitive your camera sensor is to light. You can think of it like a dimmer switch for your sensor. The lower your ISO, the less sensitive your camera sensor is to light, meaning the darker the photo. The higher your ISO, the more sensitive your sensor is to light, meaning the brighter the photo. Great, now that we know how these three settings affect our overall exposure, let's go back and talk about the side effects each one introduces when we raise or lower them. Let's go back to aperture. I've set up a scene behind me to help visualize this. So right now I'm at f1.8 and the nose of my orange triceratops is in focus, but everything else is blurry and out of focus. And that is because the other aspect of your photo that aperture affects is the depth of field or the depth of the photo that's in focus. 
Here at f1.8, this is the depth of field of the image. Everything in front of or behind this area is out of focus. This shallow depth of field is great when you're taking a solo portrait and want a nice blurry background. But what about when you're taking a family or a group shot of people that are different distances from your camera? Well, all I have to do is decrease the size of my aperture. Let's bring it down to f6.3. And now our whole dinosaur family is in focus because with a smaller aperture, you get a deeper depth of field. Okay, now we have the depth of field we want for this group shot, but our image is now too dark. So to brighten it back up, let's move to shutter speed. In order to brighten it back up, I wanna decrease my shutter speed or leave my shutter open longer so that more light hits the sensor. Let's bring it down to 1 30th of a second. And now our family's in focus and everything is properly exposed. But shutter speed also has its own side effect. And if you look at the engine from the start of this video, you'll see in the photo with the faster shutter speed, it doesn't look like the engine's moving at all. But in the photo with the slower shutter speed, the engine looks blurry and out of focus. This is because the other aspect of our photo that shutter speed affects is motion blur or how motion is captured. Think of the engine's movement as any movement in your scene. If you want to freeze motion in your photos, you need a high shutter speed that is faster than the movement of the object you're trying to freeze. If you want to do creative photos of light trails, astrophotography, or want to get smooth looking water in your landscape photos, then you need a slower shutter speed. Also, side note, whenever you are hand holding the camera, you will introduce motion blur if your shutter speed is not high enough. Camera shake is something many beginners forget to consider and don't understand why their images are coming out blurry. Most people will introduce camera shake if their shutter is slower than 1 60th of a second. So if you want or need to shoot slower than that, just make sure you're on a tripod. Personally, when I'm shooting a normal portrait of a person and I'm hand holding the camera, I like to stay at or above 1 200th of a second. I am a shaky human and I like caffeine. So I know that at 1 200th of a second, my shutter speed is fast enough to freeze any of their slight movements as well as any camera shake I would introduce. So let's get back to our dinosaur family and pretend that I'm hand holding the camera this time. Like I said, the slowest shutter I want is 1 200th of a second. But let's pretend our engine represents some dinosaur kids running around and we wanna freeze their motion too. I'm gonna to set my shutter speed even higher to 1 640th and take a photo. Now everything's in focus and their motion is frozen, but we're underexposed. So what do we do now? Now is the time to increase our ISO to compensate. I'll go up to ISO 2000 and now everyone in our photo is in focus, the speed of our children is frozen and our image is properly exposed. But you guessed it, changing the ISO also has its own side effects. As you increase the ISO, you introduce more and more noise into your image. Eventually, if you go high enough, it'll become a smudgy, noisy mess. For example, here is a shot at ISO 320 and the same shot at ISO 51,200. So when it comes to your ISO, you wanna keep it as low as possible to get the cleanest image. Great, so now that we know how each of these three settings work and how they affect our final image, how do we put it all into practice? Well, here's the four step process I use for every photo. First, I start with my camera's lowest ISO. In this case, ISO 100. Then I adjust for what is most important to me by asking myself this question. In this photo, do I care more about how much is in focus, the aperture, or the amount or lack of motion blur or shutter speed? Then I adjust for the other one, either aperture or shutter speed, and finally, I increase my ISO as needed. So let's say I wanna take a solo portrait of the orange Triceratops, and he's posing for me. The most important aspect of this photo for me would be having an aperture large enough to give me that blurry background. So first, I'll set my ISO to 100. Second, because the blurry background is the most important to me, I will then set my aperture. I'll increase it to F2. Third, I'll set my shutter speed. Because it's too bright, I'll darken the photo by increasing my shutter speed to 1 400th of a second, which is great because I know that this will be fast enough to avoid any camera shake or motion blur. And fourth, I'll revisit my ISO, but because my image is properly exposed, 
I don't need to increase it. And this is what that photo would look like. And just for fun, let's see what full auto mode would have done. All right, now let's pretend that the engine is my kid playing soccer and I want to freeze the motion of him playing. The most important aspect of this photo for me would be to have a shutter speed fast enough to freeze that motion. So first, I'll set my ISO to 100. Second, because freezing the motion of my kid is most important to me, I'll then set my shutter speed. I'll increase it to 1 1,000th of a second. Third, I'll set my aperture. Because it's too dark, I'll brighten it up by increasing my aperture to f3.2. I don't want to go too shallow with my depth of field, just in case he moves closer or further from my camera in the split second between the time that my camera focuses on him and I take the photo. If I were too shallow, I could get a photo that is out of focus. And fourth, I'll revisit my ISO. Because my image is still underexposed, I'll increase my ISO to 800. And this is what that photo would look like. And again, just for fun, let's see what full auto mode would have done. So as you can see, we did way better than auto mode in these scenarios and got the exact images we wanted because we now understand how to communicate with our camera through aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. I've added a free downloadable cheat sheet in the description of this video to remind you of how each variable affects your photos and included the four-step process so you can go out there and create with confidence. If you've got any questions or comments, please leave them below. And if you're constantly finding yourself in situations where your aperture and shutter speed are right where you want them, but you keep having to crank up your ISO to get proper exposure, it might be time to start adding light with a flash. So check out this video about the ultimate one light budget flash setup to get you started in flash photography. Wishing you guys all the best. Go out there, have fun, make some mistakes and learn from them. And I'll see you in the next one.